Hey, welcome Patrick. It's such a pleasure to have you my friend. Thank you so much for joining us on this show today. Trust me, the honor is all mine. Ah, uh, thank you Patrick. When I was thinking of interviewing you on this show, I was wondering how should I start my conversation with you because I can write books and books on the accomplishments that you have, on the kind of records that you have made. So let's start from very basic. Now, if I may request you to please paint a picture for us about the culture and the environment you are grown up in. Yeah, so I grew up in Northern Ireland. I was born in 1978, and that time was a time of a lot of turbulence and trouble. Where we were, there was a lot. There was a war going on between the the, the, the Irish and the British, you could say, or the Protestants and the Catholics. And the area that I grew up in was the unemployment black spot of Europe. It was a completely 100% Catholic town in a country controlled by Protestants. And with that, there was a lot of bombings and shootings and a lot of trouble in general. And for me as a young boy, it was just normal. I think from the outside looking in on, on what was happening, it, it seemed like it was a crazy place. And why would anyone ever live in such a place? But the reality is whenever you're born into such an environment, it's all that you know. And if therefore for me, Everything was normal because the thing is, all of us were very poor. And because when everyone's poor together, then no one feels poor. You know, we live in a, I live in a city now where rich and poor live side by side. And I think that's worse because if you're poor and you can see other people have got Ferraris, you have a reference point. Whereas we had no reference point. We were all equal. So your bombing and shooting was very normal to you? It, it actually, it, it's not that it's normal, normal, but it's just part of life. You know, it wasn't every day, but it, when it happened, it was almost exciting because we were children growing up and we would run down to see what was, what was these noises and what was going on, you know? Yeah. Strange as that sound. So that was the context you were born in. Yes. Yes, very, very much so. And whenever I turned... So the biggest problem in, in our society, it wasn't the bombings and the shootings, actually. And whenever I turned 16... I realized that the biggest issue that we had in our society was a victim mentality. And what I mean by that, it's where people blame something else but themselves. They don't take responsibility for their own path through life. So where I live, people blame the British, they blame the Protestants, they blame the rain, they blame the dog, they blame anything else but their, but their own sort of their own self. And so when I was 16, I had this very sort of particular insight that I would make one change in my life and it would change my entire life and it would change, my trajectory would, would go in a different way. And it was that I will never be a victim of anything ever again. I says, everything that goes wrong in my life, I'm going to take all the blame. But everything that goes right, I'm going to take all the credit. It must work both ways, you know? So that's what I did. And, mm -hmm. and I set off on a path as a, as a result of that. And it was actually just a few days later that I ended up asking myself two very specific questions, which would, which would provide me with a path towards a better life. And then what happened? As, as a teenager of 16 years, how did you process this information when there's a conversation going on inside that no matter what, I'm not going to be a victim of anything in my life. I'm going to take responsibility and ownership of my life. Then what shifted in your life? It, it was, it's, people sort of think this is a bit sad, but actually I realized right about then that no, no one, I realized that I'm sort of on my own in life and everyone else is looking out for themselves, you know, to, to different extents, but for the most part, you are responsible for your own path and therefore you must take responsibility for your path. And we live in a world now where everyone wants to be a victim. They're looking for reasons to be victims. And, I'm t and I look at them and I'm thinking their life does not end well. They're happy. They don't sleep well at night with that attitude. Whereas I think whenever you say, you know what, I didn't get the job interview. It's not the interview, the interview or the company's problem. I need to make myself better. I didn't get the grades at school. It's not because I'm a Catholic or because I'm a male or because I'm, you know, I need to study harder. I need to step up. I need to make sure that I'm so good at what I do that they can't ignore me anymore. Because talent will always shine through and people who are, have got a work ethic and have got a desire to do better will always shine through. And, and it's getting easier and easier to shine because there's more and more people looking for reasons to blame others why they're not shining. But the reason why they're not shining is because they're being victims and they're blaming others for the fact that they're not successful. Yeah. So tell me the next decade after that. So between the age of 16 and 26, how did you set goals for yourself and ensured that you achieved them? 
Yeah. So when I was, as I was saying, just a few days after I decided I would never be a victim of anything, I actually asked myself two very big questions. And the first question was, okay, I want to do better in life, but what does that mean? So the question was simply, if I could have or do any three things in the world, what would they be? And for me, I wanted to go big. I wanted, so I said, the first thing, if I could have anything in the world, the most important thing for me as a 16 year old boy was to have season tickets at Old Trafford, watching Manchester United, next door to the cricket ground. The second thing was I wanted to have a Porsche before I was 30. And the third thing was I wanted to travel around the world. Now, my problem is where I live, people didn't fly over and back to Manchester to watch football every weekend. The other problem is I had never seen a Porsche in my life. I had seen more car bombs than sports cars. Where I lived, there was no Porsches, but I had seen it from Top Gear and different programs, you know, whatever was on TV or the newspaper, I knew these cars existed. And then the third thing was I wanted to travel the world because I seen it watching James Bond. I used to watch James Bond, like on BBC with my family at night. So I thought, I want to go to these, these cruises and these train travels through India and all these countries. And so what I did is I asked myself a second question once I had a list of three things written down. And the second question is, what do I need to, what are the three steps that I need to do to get me closer to those goals? And my biggest problem wasn't the fact that I was sitting in, in, a, in the wrong location in the world. My biggest problem is that I wasn't good at anything. Like no one ever pushed, pointed at me and says, he's going to go far. Or he's going to do a great job in hmm. this profession or that profession. No one really believed in me. Okay. You know? And um, so where that left me was, I had to really delve into myself and go, what, what do I need to, what, can, what am I okay at? So when I looked at what I was okay at at school, it was mathematics. So I said, the best thing I can do with that, I think, based on where I am, is become a chartered accountant. So I set three steps. I said, number one step is I'm going to stop messing around in school and try and come top of the class by the time I'm 18. So it give me two years. Yeah. Then I want to become the first person from my area to go to university. No one has ever been. And then third, I wanted to um, go to D Belfast or Dublin to become a chartered accountant. And that's where th that's that step that sort of took me from 16 through to 26. Yeah. Now, help me understand. I'm sure with the kind of society that you were a part of, where you did not see a Porsche in your life at that point in time, apart from watching them in TV commercials or watching them in any of the Hollywood movies, right? I'm sure you would have come across certain challenges as well. So how did you manage to keep your focus despite so many challenges that life threw at you? The most important thing is that you write it down. There's such an amazing power within a pen or a pencil. When you write something down, it actually makes a connection to something deeper within you. And when you put that piece of paper with those goals written down somewhere, for me, I kept it beside my bed. So even though I wanted to play football, I, you know, I would always say, I'm going to do my homework first. And then I'm going to go out and play football afterwards because I have a goal that I don't want to just watch the football on Saturday. I want to be at Old Trafford. And I always had a bigger goal. And I mean, it might have only been 30 minutes of homework. So it wasn't, it wasn't such a big commitment. But it was literally just knowing that I was doing, I wanted to do more with my life. And I wanted to have more. So if I, the more I put in, the more I would get out. That's my approach. Yeah. And there's such an amazing power to writing something down. So what I'm listening right now is, in case you would like to achieve something, then first of all, it all begins with asking this question. If I want to be better, what does that mean? Ask yourself, what are the top three goals that I would want to achieve in my life? That's one. The second question is, what are the top three things that I can do that could help me to go closer to those goals? And the third thing that you mentioned, something really beautiful is just write it down. Absolutely. That. And I wrote a book about this entire process. And the book, the book is called Life Is... Or the other book is called The Backpacker Who Sold the Supercar. And it basically talks you through the process that I went through and the first three goals. And then it's a book based on the best things in life that I achieved as a result of these three goals. Because once you do the first three, you don't stop. You, you, you continue then your goals. Precisely. And would love to know more about your, in fact, you have written four books. And I understand that you are um, writing another book, Patrick. Here, my question is, what do you think, what is the mindset required to achieve your goals and dreams in your life? The mindset is persistence. The enemy of failure is persistence. So the person who tries and gives up is the only person who loses or fails. The person who just keeps going back at it every day, whether it's cricket, football, writing, business, selling, the person who's there every day and persisting and working hard to get better and better usually wins in the end. 
And I mean, if we look at our sporting heroes across every nation, they're the people who probably had the least chance starting off, but they just kept going back at it. Thank you. So one one should be persistent. When you try something, keep going back and be there every day. Keep getting better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Patrick, you have traveled seven continents. You have traveled 141 countries. So please tell me one thing which you have found common across geographies, across cultures, across nationalities. The one thing that I find is that the most important thing in life is people. Being around people that um, can challenge you or elevate you or confront you or care for you or love you or give you something. People are, the, every, I see every person as a, as a teacher and as a student. So every person I meet, I can hopefully teach them something. But I know for sure that they can teach me something. And that, sometimes that may be a negative thing that they teach me a lesson, like don't do that again, or it might be a really positive thing where they elevate me and bring me up. But no matter where I go in the world, I believe that all people are good, but good people can do stupid things when they're stressed. So when people get into gangs or get into drugs or stealing or crime, it's because they were stressed and they were sort of forced in there because circumstances demanded it. Or if people are stressed and they're, you know, they're normally good people, but they're doing something stupid, you know, the one time, something's probably going on in their work or their marriage or something else, which has caused them to act in such a stupid way. So people, I believe people are allowed to screw up. Hopefully they don't do it too often and hopefully they don't do it too big of a level. Um, so I have a rule for myself, whereas I know that 99 days in 100 that every person I meet, I will have, I have a thing that if I cross your path, your life should be better off because I crossed your path. Like I should leave you with something, a compliment, a kindness, a, a wave, a smile. I should leave people with something that makes their life better because they walked across my path. However, 99 days in 100, I could be an asshole. I could meet someone and they could say, insult my wife and I'll give them such a volley back. And you know what? I'm actually, I've made peace with that because I'm not perfect. I am a boy from a poor area where pe- we can be quite rough and we can have a bit of chat in us to, you know, we can give back some abuse to people. But I decided that if I can be an asshole three days a year, but the rest of the year I can be nice to people and, you know, respectful and help them elevate their path. I says, you know, I'm okay with that because we all like, I'm the asshole that someone meets every someday and they're the, some days I meet them and they're being the asshole. And I mean, they're, they're 99 days in a hundred. Probably everyone is cool or most people are cool 99 days in a hundred. And I always say to people, like, you all right, I screwed up today. You screwed up yesterday. He'll screw up tomorrow. But let's try and have a gap between our next screw up. So true, so true. So help me understand, Patrick. Uh, you know, during your travel from one country to another, and I also know that you have visited India as well. And one of your favorite places is Varanasi. Beautiful. Right? If you can share one of those experiences of visiting India that had a long lasting impact on who you are as a person? Well, the truth is India has changed my life. And I'm not, you know, I'm not one of these white European people who comes down and acts all like a hippie and starts trying to dress like, I'm, you know, I'm a real human being and I'm, I'm, I'm focused on doing better and getting more money and shining brighter and I wear normal clothes. I'm not trying to steal Indian culture. However, whenever I went to Varanasi, I had drove, I was driving from London to Sydney. So I was driving all through Europe into Turkey, through Iran, into Pakistan, and then into India. That was my path by bus and by car. And I arrived in this magical, one of the oldest cities in the world called Varanasi. And it was just a hive of activity. People everywhere, like smells, culture, food, spices, beeping, you know, beautiful Indian town. And we went down to the Ghats. For, for um, in the darkness, for, but we wanted to be in, in the Ganges for, for sunrise. And I, hadn't, I didn't know much of the culture of the city before I had arrived because I had been backpacking for about uh, one and a half years maybe before that, I think. So I was almost like in this sort of backpacker zone and I was just taking day by day. However, this sunrise, I, 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 took, I was wearing shorts. I went, I went into my thighs, into the Ganges, into the river, the Great Mother. And that moment changed my life forever. And I told this to my parents when I got back. There's a, something was imparted to me or something happened to me that I can't really put into words, but I can feel it in my heart with, when, as I stood in that Ganges. And it wasn't like a bolt of lightning. It was like a seed being planted, like an apple seed. 
planted in the ground and, it, and over the years it has been left to grow and nourish and give off fruit, which makes the world sort of a better place in general. But I can trace it back to that sunrise standing knee deep in the Ganges and just everything changed after that for me. Like I, I stopped, I used to eat meat up, and, up until then. I think a few months later I was, I was vegetarian, now I'm vegan. You know, like very, very small sort of progressive things have come out of that um, time that I spent in the Ganges. And, and not just the Ganges, in India generally. And I'm not get, trying to go too spiritual on people. I'm just saying there's a really special resonance there. I mean, there's every, India has got everything. It's got probably the worst, worst people in the world and the best, best people in the world and everything in between. It's got the richest, richest and the poorest, poorest and everything in between. That's India. India is all things to all people. And yes. if you look between the, the, the noise of India, there's a really special resonance of, of love and energy and compassion and hmm. spirituality within that land. And it lives within the hearts of, of the people there who have been blessed to live on that land. So what's your take on finding your calling and finding your purpose? Because what I'm listening to right now, as you mentioned that something happened and you realize that there's a seed that has been sown, an apple seed. And then slowly and steadily, it started to showing results. What's your take on finding your calling and finding your purpose? Now, I'm going to the very holistic level, the very top level of um, spiritualism when I say this. And I think in life, we have two jobs. We've been given two roles by the God. And it's this. The first job is to find out, why am I here? And the second job is to go and fulfill what you've found out. And for every, I believe that there's probably two ways to find it. The first way is to, is to um, really go and search. And where, you, where the answer is, is, is it lies with inside you. And we live in a noisy world, which makes it difficult to hear the, 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 the voice inside. But you still have to realize that that's external. What happens inside is, is all that matters. So you have to, I think you can go there and find out this is who I am. And then... It may come at you like a bolt of lightning or it may be planted like a seed. And, and, and I think for there's, there's other people then who find out their path without going inside. It, it hits them like a bolt of lightning. They're sitting on the toilet or they're you know, on a fairground attraction or something and they just get up. This is the reason I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And the journey actually begins from going within yourself yeah. rather than looking for announcers in different books and movies. Uh, the journey is to go within yourself. You know, this reminds me of one of my conversations with Radhanath Swami. I'm sure you would have heard of ISKCON, Hare Rama, Hare Krishna. Yeah. So one of the leaders of ISKCON, I got an opportunity and honor to interview him. And he's written a book called The Journey Home, part yeah. one and part two. And the interview was around that. So I asked Radhanath Swamiji, I said, Radhanath Swamiji, you have mentioned about finding your calling in this book several times. I'm a very small boy, still in my nappies. I don't know how to find my calling. How can I find my calling? Yeah. And Radhanath Swamiji gave me a beautiful smile like a child. He started giggling like a child. He said, ah, I never thought about that. But what I can tell you is it begins with the same question. And ask this question from yourself. How can I find my calling? And see the way your inner self will guide you and help you navigate your path in that direction. It's a beautiful answer. And, and actually, I do something which is more uh, just, just to, because I think you have to charge it. I think you have, the more you listen to something and within yourself, the more power you give it. So I could be, I live in Stockholm now in Sweden, and I could walk out. If I have to go, say, from my front door to a restaurant, I could come to my front door and just put my two hands out and go, should I go left or right? And I know the restaurant is to my right, but if my, if my heart tells me, go left, I'll go left. And I'll come to the next junction and I'll say, go left or right. And I could go left again. So it's actually taken me away from where I would go directly if I just went with my head. But the thing that I notice is when I do this, just, and I do it just to show my heart that I'm listening to it, is that I, I could come across an amazing person or someone could drop a wallet and I helped them pick it up. And my job was to sort of make sure they didn't lose it because they had all their cards in it or all their money. And the thing is, I could be gone in such a weird way to get to the destination I was hoping to get to. But it might only be two minutes later than what if, what if I had went direct. 
but I've had like three or four amazing experiences and seen the like, cherry blossom and seen tr- like new streets I hadn't seen before. And, and again, it's just me saying to my heart, like I'm listening. Like, so whenever I'm not being so focused, just tell me as well. Like sometimes I'm not asking you directly, but just, I'm still listening. So give me the answers. You're, you're the guidance, you're the compass. Yeah. Listen, listen and listen. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you so much for sharing that. And with this, we are just entering into the second phase of this interview. And this is probably the most exciting phase because I'm going to ask you questions and in just one breath or a sentence, you have to answer me. It's surprise rapid question answer round. So gear up. So there are 10 questions. And as I mentioned, you have to answer them without thinking. Just jump in. And here we go. Your favorite country? Ireland. Your favorite dish? Vegan burger and chip. Define God in one word. Love. What did you buy from your first salary? A jumper. Your favorite book? Life is. A friend you miss the most? Terry McGonagall. Who did you say I love you for the first time? My family. My mother probably or my father. I say it a lot to everyone. Something that you cannot stand? People who mistake kindness for weakness. One of your values that you will never compromise in life. All you need is love. Something you say to somebody you love. I trust you. I trust you too. Thank you so much. So that was the rapid question answer round. Thank you so much for uh, being in flow and just sharing that was coming to you rather than using your brain. And I think that is what, what, what you've been talking about, the trusting your deeper self and let it flow through you. Yeah. Can I ask you this then? What what do you see as what do you see as God? What what's what's your definition of God or universe? Uh, trusting yourself, trusting humanity, yeah, kindness, forgiveness, compassion, acceptance. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Shall we move on? Please. Fantastic. So, Patrick, I understand that you are the head of growth business intelligence for the city of Stockholm. Yes. And you directly work with the CEO of Stockholm, Sweden. So tell me a day in the life of Patrick. How does the day look like for somebody who doesn't know Patrick? Yes, for me, the morning is very important. I get up in the morning and the first thing I will do is stretch out. I will wake up my body. I will make sure that my body is stretched, that the nutrients can flow through my back and the energy and the chi can flow through my body. The very next thing I do is I will meditate i will sit down cross my knees on the sofa and do the mudra and meditate through my really come into my breathing very simple 16 second um, meditation which i do and then i can do some chanting like just uh, because i believe light informs but sound transforms sound is everything so the sounds that we can make can really take us on a higher frequency Depending if I'm fasting or not, I may or may not have breakfast. Today I had a smoothie and some toast with my wife. Most of this week I've been doing fasting or I've been doing intermittent fasting a lot. I think we eat too much food across the world, and which is the sad thing is that there's a lot of people in who don't have enough food. And then I will try to, when it comes to my work day, I will try to do creative work in the morning and I will try to keep away from emails. Because emails is someone else's to-do list, which they have sent to you. So when you respond, when you're doing emails, you're actually filling in other people's to-dos. And I believe that before lunchtime is whenever I can do the most sort of strategic and creative work. Whenever I'm having like a, a, a slump at 3 p.m., I can do emails and that around that time. Uh, I always leave the office. The, I am working for the city of Stockholm, so we must be in the office during these COVID-19 times a few times a week. So if I will always go out for lunch. And if I have lunch with me, I will still leave and go for a walk because I want to, instead of having 10, I don't have a five day week in the work. I have 10 half days. So I break each day into a half day. So I have two half days per day. And the second, as I say, the second day is a very, the second part of my day is very different from the first part of my day because I do different type of tasks in the evening. When I come home from work, I will always have uh, dinner with my wife and then I will either go to the gym and run to practice for the marathon or I will go for a walk into the trees. And I'm a, I'm a big tree hugger. I'm always in the forest, in the nature, 
beside the water. Every time I see a tree, every, when, every time I'm out, I won't hug every tree, but I'll always hug at least one tree just because I believe that we should give something back to Mother Nature, you know, just to tell her, like, I'm so grateful for, for what you're doing for us, cleaning our air, providing us with oxygen, providing us with beautiful sights. And whenever I'm in front of water, I always see the current, the currency. So I'm always giving gratitude for the flow. Water always reminds me of gratitude. And I live, I live in a forest in, this, in, in Stockholm, which is beside the water. And I got a really, again, I was blessed to get this apartment for such a good price. I could live in such a, an area which suits me as on my spirit. And then at nighttime, I try to get to bed early, but the problem is sometimes I can get caught up on social media and I could, an hour could go past and then I'm like, oh, shit. You know, yes. so, but it's, um, I don't have a TV at all. So I have, I, if, if I'm looking at it holistically, I work eight hours, I sleep eight hours and I have eight hours to do other projects. And that other projects is writing books, running marathons, training, walking in the nature, whatever else. So I see my day, um, broken into three blocks and the magic happens in the, in the, in the middle eight hour block. So what has been the philosophy of your life? Um, the philosophy of my life has been to just keep going because hmm. as I said at the start, I'm really on my own. You know, I have a lot of friends, I have a lovely wife, but really I'm on my own and I have to keep going. I have to give back. I have to, I have to help the people that can never help me. All the money from my books that I write goes to help on the homeless people. Every cent always has, always will. I have to keep going because I know that there's a lot of people on, if I look at it holistically, there's a lot of people who look out at me, even though they don't. A lot of the people, a lot of your biggest fans, a lot of people who really respect you the most are the people you never hear from. They're just seen in the background. And I've come across a few people who have written on, like, they write down beside their desk or something at home, what would Patrick Hamilton Walsh do? And I was like, wow, that hmm. blows my mind that someone would even consider like their path through life is what would Patrick do in this situation? And there was a guy who sat beside me at work and he had, WWPHWD, and I says, What's that? And he goes, That's literally, I sit beside you, and I have what would Patrick Hamilton wants to do in this situation whenever I have a question. Mm. And then one of the, I met a girl from New Zealand years ago. She says, Whenever she's got a life problem, she asks, What would Patrick do here? And I don't know her that well, but whatever way I planted a seed in that girl, she thought, well, This guy's got a shit together, and I don't. Yeah. But, but so I, I keep going, number one, I keep going for myself. Because I have to, because no one's going to pull me up. And number two, I keep going because I know there's other people who you do expect stuff of me. Yeah. And I think that's how you are making a difference in the lives of the people. That's how you're inspiring the world. And that's how you are living your purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Patrick, I'm sure in this journey, you would have dealt with your own insecurities as well. So how do you manage to deal with your insecurities? I th so there's, I think whenever you're a teenage years and you're going through puberty and things, you really have, that's your time for your most insecurities because you're not sure of your place in the world. Up until I was 16, at least. And when I turned 16, at least I had a, a goal. But I think as I've got older, I've been able to accept who I am and go. And, and it's not so much that I, it's not so much that I really am sure of who I am. It's that I'm really sure of who I'm not. Like, I know that I'm not you. You're so much better than me in so many ways. And I can't, I can't be the man you are. Like, you're a great communicator. And you're a, you're a really, I, I see your wife and I see, you're, you're such a great man in so many ways that I can't be, I can't be you. So and I'm, I accept that. I also can't be Sachin Tom Dunkel. I mean, that guy's a rock star. I also can't be David Beckham. Um, so I, I really know who I'm not. And I'm, I'm not trying to be these people. So what I'm trying to do is just be me. And I think some of the best ways to find out who you are is to realize who you am not. And then that takes away a lot of your insecurities. I would love to be Sachin Tom Dulker. I mean, playing cricket in front of 100,000 people in Melbourne, knocking a little of the park and Indians around the world losing their minds. Yeah. How good could that be? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me about a situation in your life which you found really challenging. And how did you manage to overcome that? Something, I have to be honest with you, I don't find things to be really challenging. I see, I see that every day, as long as I give it my best, like I have an approach that I, this it may be something that I can't do, but if I get started, I will see how far I go. And again, if, if I really want to overcome this, by persistence, I will get there. 
And it means there's some people who are just super talented and they will get there quicker than me. And there's some people who are lesser talented and they will get there slower. But if, we're, if, if there's three people and we're all equally persistent, we will all get to the goal. It's just that we will get there at different time frames because some are just more talented than others. And, and therefore, that's how I approach every problem that I have. And I come up against problems every single day. Like I, I started my own podcast recently called Patrick Hamilton Walsh Podcast. And again, I don't, all I have is, all I have is a, a phone and a, and, a, and a free headphones I got with it. And that's, again, that's a challenge, because, but I have to make sure I have the right, the right um, room and the right temperature and the right things to make the sound come across good. But what I know that's the most important is that I get to talk to people like you because that helps me because people are not tuning in for the best sound. They're tuning in for the best content to hear insights and wisdom. And as long as I focus on what's really important, people are willing to overcome the other things. And so yeah. therefore that's the challenge. Like just persist through it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Patrick. And Patrick, I understand that there are several laurels with your name. There are several accomplishments and achievements that you have. Um, so you have written four books. The first one was is the second one was life is the third one was the backpacker who sold his supercar. And then you have also written a book called forgive me sister. Yes. And um, you have got a Guinness world record yeah. in your name. And uh, you have traveled, as I mentioned, 141 countries, right? What has been your biggest learning out of this? One biggest learn. My biggest learning from everything I've ever done is just to, and it seems so simple, but it's just to be myself. Like I am enough. I'm, I might not be the best. I might not be the greatest. I might not sh be the shiniest star, but I'm enough. I'm enough to be in the circumstance that I'm in. And if I'm in the circumstance, there must be a reason why I'm there. So I can just, just okay, there's people who are better in the circumstance than me, but I'm, here. I'm meant to be here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. And yes. the fact that I'm here means I'm enough. I'm just going to be myself and be true to that and just share that. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Patrick, I come across several people who would want to write a book. So if you were to give a piece of advice to the budding authors, what would that be? I, I, I've got two pieces of advice. And I want to ask you if it's okay, can I break it into fiction and nonfiction? Absolutely. So Please one, go ahead. The first one is fiction, which is storytelling, which is something you make up out of the blue. And my last book was called Forgive Me, Sister. And it was actually easier than my other books, which were nonfiction. They were based on fact and stuff. So nonfiction is about, I think the most important thing is to write the first word. Have an idea and start in the middle of your story and then work out. So like, this is where I want, the story is about who uh, travels the world and eats, a, eats a, a dragon, for example. Well, you've got the part of your story in the middle. Now you have to find out how did the boy get to the situation where he met a dragon and what happens after the dragon? So start in the middle and make that good and then just work your way out at each side. And, and then just, just mm -hmm. work on it like, like it's a, you're nurturing a tree or a, a plant or something. Just grow it and make it better and read back over it and, and put it out to be criticized. And the most important thing is that you, put, you give it to people who are genuinely going to criticize it because nearly everyone will say, that's good. That's awesome. Well done. And that's the last thing you want to hear. Because if you don't hear it from your friends, you're going to hear it on Amazon comments. Hmm. You need people to be honest with you and tell you that's crap. You need to fix it here and here and here. You know? And that, so that's a book of fiction. The other, the other book is nonfiction, which is like Life Is, my book Life Is, or a business book. And again, so I'm, I'm at the moment, my book Life Is was a book about what you said at the start, how I went from being in the unemployment black spot of Europe to achieving all my dreams by the time I was 28 before I went backpacking. I mean, all my childhood dreams. So that was my introduction. Again, I knew where to get. And then I wanted to just put, I think when you have your introduction to a book of um, nonfiction, like a, a factual book, then you need to say, how many chapters do I want? And then it's all about compartmentalizing. So I always say, go for eight. Go for eight chapters and figure out what's in them. And then say about heading, what falls under that heading? And just write five bullet points. Next heading, what goes under that? Five bullet points. So now you've got the rib cage. You have, you have actually got a full book now within a space of two hours. Mm. You have your intro, you have all your chapters, and you have all your headings. And of course, it's your book, so you know what goes under each heading. It's just a matter of writing three or four lines. 
And so, and again, I'm not going at this. I'm not a great writer. I'm not even a good writer. But I'm, I'm again, I persist, and I find a systematic way to get things over the line. So when everyone else was stocking up on toilet paper, I was stocking up on shares. Hand sanitizer will never be more expensive, but Amazon shares will never be more cheaper. You know, and at the same time, when everyone else was like watching Netflix, I wrote a book. So in eight weeks, as of last Sunday, I started. I I had the first draft of my new business book, which is about talent attraction during the age of pandemic. And what did I do? I wrote a, I wrote a introduction. This is what talent attraction is about, and this is the pandemic. And then I picked eight headings, and I just put in head sub. Uh, and I mean, I've got a full time job. I'm training for a marathon. I'm doing. I'm married. I've got a lot of stuff I have to do, but. If I can do 30 minutes, I can get a heading done and I can fill in two of the headings. Yeah. Hey, that's a good advice. That's a very good advice. And it, it actually has, it has given me a pathway from where to begin and how it's going to evolve from there. So Patrick, wherever you are right now in your life, what are the three things that you want for yourself now? Yeah. The most important thing I always want is, and it's, I'm, I'm going to answer this in two ways. First thing I want is just to be healthy, to be healthy and energized. Second thing is to be happy. I believe that's the goal. And I think, and, and then the third one is to, is, to, is to be wealthy. I believe happiness, health, and wealth are the three things that sort of are required because we are, and pe- people are very weird about talking about money. But we live, we live in, a, in a society where much you need money to operate and to function. And increasingly so, you need credit. And as things go from being on a cash-based society to being on a credit ba- or on a digital-based society, like we have in Sweden, people, most shops don't take cash anymore and they haven't for a long time. So we have uh, microchips, people have microchips in their hand, people have credit cards, of course, and you know, Apple Pay and Samsung Pay and these things. And that's just numbers that you need to get on a bus and to get off a bus and to have a dinner and to have so we need to be healthy or else we won't get out of bed we need to be happy to make the day fun and we need to be wealthy to mm. to survive at whatever rate that wants to be so that's mm. the three things i'm looking for at all times so now if you reflect on your life what are your unfulfilled aspirations two things i'm i am healthy i am happy the two things i really want in the next few years, one is the first thing I want is to have a, our first child. I'm ready now. I'm at the age where my wife has just turned 32 and she has her career going very well. So hopefully she'll want to have a baby soon. Uh, second thing is my financial goal, which is more of a long-term goal, which I'm nowhere near, is to have 111 million euros. I really so, want, and the reason why that number, it's a, it's a, it's a it's strange a, yeah. number. But the reason why that number works for me is that Three, six, and nine are the numbers of the universe. Hmm. And three, so six, and nine. Three, six, nine. So it's three ones, six zeros, and nine numbers in total. Ah, oh, okay, okay. That's interesting. Thank you so much. It's a, very, it's a very spiritual number for me. I believe that if I'm going to aim for something, I might as well aim big. And uh, Patrick, I had great learning here. Let me just uh, share with you what are my learnings here. You know, focus on what you really want. Ask yourself, what does better mean to you? Set three goals for yourself and then ask yourself, what can I do to make this happen? Be persistent in your life. When you try and keep going back, you'll be able to achieve that. Be there every day and keep getting better. Who you are not. Keep your search on, keep walking and ask yourself, why am I here? Go and fulfill the purpose. Be yourself and that's enough. Another three things that I loved was be healthy, be happy and be wealthy. And the magical numbers that you have shared, three, six, and nine. Mm -hmm. So here is my last question to you, Patrick. Now, what do you know for sure with 100% surety and certainty now? The one thing I know for sure is that life is a journey. And we are all on various stages of that journey along the roads and the things, a lot of the things I believed last year or five years ago or 10 years ago, I think the opposite now. So it's a really good question to ask me at a time whenever I'm realizing that almost everything is in fluctuation. Nothing is permanent and everything is in co- and change is the only constant. So therefore, the only thing that I truly know for sure is that it's a journey and that I must 
see it as a journey. And as I say, hopefully every person who crosses my path, they'll be better off as a result of it. And again, there's going to be days, three days in a year where I'm going to sharpen my teeth and be a bit of an asshole. And that's okay. Mm. It's not good, but I have to accept it because I am enough. And my Mm. good side is enough and my bad side is enough. But Mm. let's try and keep it on the good side as much as possible. I'm not too strong on myself whenever I do the wrong side. Thank you so much, Patrick. And I remember our first conversation almost like seven, eight months back when you mentioned that life does not happen to us. It happens for us. Look for the positives in every situation and don't follow too closely those who shout loudest. So thank you so much. It was wonderful interacting with you again, Patrick. And it was such a pleasure listening to you, uh, reflecting on your life journey, reflecting on your life lessons. And uh, I'm humbled to have you in this conversation. Stay blessed, my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm really humbled. And this, as we, as we know, this is two brothers talking once again in this lifetime. And, uh, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk again in many more lifetimes, but we have a lot more to do in this lifetime together. Yes, yes. Looking forward, Patrick. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, brother. <laughs>